Redeemer Church of Ventura to gather on in, find a place to see. Looks like you guys have. Let's all stand together as we begin worship this morning. Stand together as we sing How Firm a Foundation. song we're singing, maybe a new song. I don't know if it's been sung in Redeemer's Church before, but I'm going to read Psalm 121 for you. It was real fitting with what we're going to be talking about today, the story of Hagar and Ishmael. The song's called I Will Look Up. So Psalm 121 says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord that we have a God that is trustworthy, that is faithful. That is good to us, even when we can't see it. We don't know what's going on sometimes, and yet God is still who he is. He's still on the throne, and when we do look up and we turn our eyes to him, we know that he is there. He is faithful and will never leave us. And let's sing, I will look up. If you know it, sing it really loud. i 
of this world I will lay them at your feet surrender every anxious thought for perfect peace your perfect peace all the loved ones I hold dear My hopes and dreams and all my fears So trust your name in everything In everything I will look up I will look up For there is none above you I will bow down To tell you that I need Jesus, Lord of all, I will take you at your word. Jesus, you have taken hold of me. All my life is in your hands. You are my strength. You are my strength. God is a faithful God, a God who will not be shaken, a God who will not be moved, a God that we can always look to.
ground beneath my feet gives way and i hear the sound of crashing waves all my world is washing out to sea i'm hidden safe in the guy who never moves holding fast to the promise of the truth you are holding tight still to me oh, the rock won't move and his word is strong the rock won't move and his love can't be undone. The rock won't move and his word is strong. The rock won't move and his love can't be undone. The rock of our salvation. Hope is in the promise of your blood, my support within the raging flood, even in the tempest I can see. I'm hidden safe in the God who never moves, holding fast to the promise of the truth. You are holding tight still to me. Oh, the rock won't move and his word is strong. The rock won't move and his love can't be undone. Oh, the rock won't move and his word is strong. The rock won't move and his love can't be undone. The rock of our salvation. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. The rock won't move, the rock won't move. When Christ seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. The rock won't move, the rock won't move. On Christ the solid rock, on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. The rock won't move. Oh, the rock won't move. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest in his unchanging grace. The rock won't move. The rock won't move. The rock won't move, and his word is strong. The rock won't move, and his love can't be. The rock won't move and his love can't be undone. The rock of our salvation. The rock of our salvation. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can run to you, that we can look to you and never be disappointed, that to never, ever fret for a moment that you are not there. But God, you are good. You are our rock. We can fully rely on you, lean on you, cast every burden and care upon you, Lord, for there is nothing that is too great for you. Lord, I pray, Lord, that as a congregation, we would lift one another up to push one another towards you, that we may look to you together, or that we may come alongside one another, encourage one another, and carry one another, if need be, knowing that you, God, are the one that carries us. Be glorified through us this very morning as we continue to worship you through the preaching of your word. In your son's name we pray. Amen.
guys are going to be seated. Good morning, Redeemer's Church. It is great to worship with every single one of you. Redeemer's kids, you guys are off with Mr. Rob Wiggins to go learn about Jesus. Uh, the rest of you, why don't we all open up God's word, okay? Genesis chapter 16. And uh, it was my hope and prayer this week that as we open up the inspired word of God this morning, uh, that today and this morning would be uh, an encouragement that mobilizes our people into dark and difficult spaces uh, to shine the light of Christ into a world that needs him. Uh, this morning, we are uh, in a, a difficult story. Uh, one of those stories where uh, you find yourself uh, talking with people, you find yourself like, oh, why, Lord, why is this in the Bible? Like, it, it, of all the things, like, can't we, can't we, this is a, an awkward space. This makes us look bad. This makes God look bad. And so we sit here and think with a, a passage in a text like Genesis chapter 16 that it would just be better off if God left texts like this out of Scripture and that we don't really need them. But what we actually find is that Scripture is so true to our life experience that it's in these nitty and gritty and difficult passages of Scripture where we actually draw our most hope and encouragement from, uh, from all the pages of Scripture. Uh, this isn't a, a Disneyland movie. This isn't a fairy tale, happily ever after. Uh, this, when we, as we teach through God's Word, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, not skipping anything that God has placed there for us, we, what we find is that when we enter into difficult spaces, when we enter into family drama and doctor's appointments and all of these things that are going on in our lives, we need texts like this because they teach us of the character of our God that carries us through the most dark and difficult moments. So as we're in Genesis 16, what we've got to do this morning is we've got to deal with the hard stuff. We've got to deal with the hard ethical problems. Why does God allow this? Why does, uh, what, what is this in the text? Why, uh, why culturally does this happen? And then we enter into, even at the, the end of chapter 16, a revelation of God that is supposed to change the way how you and I live this next week. And so uh, as we open up to Genesis chapter 16, again, Again, it's just my hope, because I know there are people in this room. I'm aware of some of it, uh, but I'm, I'm unaware of much of the difficult spaces that God is calling you into uh, in your marriages, at your, in your workplace, on campus, or wherever it may be. And so let this be a, a thoroughly well thought through revelation of who God is upon which you can stand as you enter into these spaces. Let's, uh, let's start in verse 1. Let me read the text, and you can follow along in, uh, as I read. Genesis 16, verse 1. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, had bore, bore him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may, it may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And so... And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave you my servants to your embrace. And when she saw that she conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do with her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her and fled from her. Let's pause there for a moment. You perhaps have heard this text taught before. Uh, perhaps you've read this text before. But let us, with, with fresh eyes, look at the, the darkness that's in this text. Leave the familiarity behind 
And, and just look at the layers of depravity, of sin and darkness that exist in these first six verses as described. First of all, let's just step right into it. Abraham and Sarah have slaves. You can call it a servant if you want. In the Old Testament text, the translators of the ESV have chosen to go that way. But if you can give someone to someone else so that they make a baby, that's a level of slavery that approximates what we saw at the beginning of our country. So Abraham and Sarah are here slavery, it, 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 trading in slaves. Sarah then, in the giving of her servant to her husband, is trafficking. I mean, let's just use all of today's cultural you know, all the big, big words of the culture, big uh, points of the culture. Yeah, I mean, it's all here in the first six verses. Abraham engages in what is at least adultery, what it certainly should be uh, at least polygamy, which the Lord never is okay with. And we have to assume at least some sort of rape. We are unaware of Hagar's consent or participation, which is mind-numbingly sad, that it's not even worthy of Sarah or Abraham to even talk about. Sarah and Abraham's pragmatic worldliness have led them towards a method of problem-solving that, that leaks depravity on every level, and they do so without even a thought, without one question, one hesitation. None of that is presented in the text. And the, the consequences, even in the, next, in the three verses afterwards, are just as bad. Hagar gets proud. She starts shaming Sarah. And, and we know that uh, from the ancient Near East, she probably starts living out as though she was Abraham's wife, or at least first wife. Maybe Abraham has even started preferring her over Sarah, his wife. And this jealousy gets to the place where Sarah blame shifts the whole situation. You did this to me, Abraham. Abraham's complicit enablement of his wife because he lacks any sort of backbone whatsoever only contributes to the situation. And so Sarah, con Sarah condones and Abraham, Abraham condones and allows Sarah to go and abuse at least emotionally, but probably physically, his her maidservant. Abraham disowns his firstborn son. A, a level of parenting abandonment that every single one of us would call CPS on. I, I, that's in the first six verses, and so we have to sit here and say, wow, like, what, what's going on here? There's levels and layers of brokenness and injustice and evil in a story we're fairly familiar with, but let's call it what it is. It's rape, slavery, abandonment, things that would send our world into, I mean, just absolutely just go online. You post any of this online, hey, this happened, and the whole, even our, uh, our fallen, unrighteous world knows that Almost everything that occurs in verses 1 through 6 is awful depravity. So, we must take pause. The Bible describes the fallen world as it really is, even though it's somewhat culturally uh, 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 separated from the way we live today. This situation in Genesis 16, verses 1 through 6, is no fairy tale. It's no, uh, it's no happily ever after, while never excusing evil or describing God as the cause of evil, the Bible presents unapologetically a real description that of the evil that exists in men's hearts and what happens because of that evil. And so instead of arguing about who started it, who's the victim, what's justice look like, what we get to see here is that God is the solution. God steps into the darkness and brings hope and life 
where there is none, like where there's no other way to find hope, when there's no other way to find peace or solutions, any whatsoever, God steps in and shows himself. And that's all that everybody needs. Point number one on your outline as we work our way through this text, verses one through six. Uh, when I live my way, I use and abuse others. When I live my way, I use and abuse others others. I, I want to uh, help us understand what m- is motivating Sarah in this text. First of all, I want you to see verse 2. Sarah I came to Abram. Behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. We'll look at that in a second. Go into my servant that it may be that I shall obtain children by her. Now, uh, it's really, at the beginning of this text, I think I just assumed while I was studying it uh, months ago, that uh, the, the popular interpretation of this text is that Sarah is trying to shortcut God's promises. Uh, and I, I get where I, I, I thought that, I was thinking that. But when I look deeper into the text, I don't think that's what's going on here. I don't think Sarah is trying to be like, well, God said, Abraham, that you would have uh, lots of descendants. And so um, let's, let's figure out this way to do this because it's been 10 years. And we've been waiting so long. So we've got to make God's promises happen. I don't think that's what's going on here here to understand the real difficult situation and what's motivating Sarah into such depravity, you have to understand the position that she is in the ancient Near Eastern world. Sarah is not looking to fulfill God's promises her way. She's not looking to take a shortcut to God's promises. And I think you can see that by the fact that she's looking for children. God had promised offspring. For last Four chapters, God had promised Abraham that he would have descendants and offspring. Sarah in the text is particular. She's, she doesn't make any reference of God's promises. She doesn't even use the words that God pro- uses when he gives Abraham a promise. She's looking for kids. And why would she be looking for kids? Because children were the significance of an ancient Near Eastern woman. Okay? Women had one job in the ancient Near East, to have babies and to build a family. That's, by every document, by every archaeological survey, by every cultural survey, that is just the plain truth reality of the fallen world that existed. The significance of a woman in the ancient Near Eastern world was babies, children. They were, for that woman, a source of rescue a retirement account, a resume, a health care plan, a survival bunker at the same time while that child was also like the Gucci bag of any woman in the ancient Near East. You must be able to do this or you have no value. That's where Sarah's sitting and she's already old, so who's going to take care of her? Who's going to provide? Who's going to make sure that financially she's fed and cared for once Abraham, who's significantly older than her, kicks the bucket? Well, that's the retirement plan. That's the savings account. That's the health care plan, the protection. When foreign armies have invaded, like we saw uh, two chapters ago, who's going to have the trained men and wield the swords and ride the horses? That's the survival bunker. But even more so, Sarah's looking at her significance. Over and over again, whenever Sarah's mentioned, the first thing that's repeated in the text is she had bore Abram no children. Now, pause, okay? When we read this text today with our our, our modern values in that lens, we would describe Sarah as a victim of patriarchal values of society, who needs to find freedom by shedding those oppressive priorities and becoming a free and independent woman. And, uh, and that's how this, cult, this, this culture would read this text. That's how it's uh, often viewed. Our culture has rejected motherhood and its traditional values and in its place built new expectations for the woman. You don't need anyone. You don't need no man. You, you can, your career... Uh, you could be a career woman who lives in a, a beautiful mid-century modern town home or, or a minimalistic van, right? And you could go do your life uh, as you've 
As you've decided, as long as that life is some sort of activism and every corner of your life is Instagrammable, right? That's, that's kind of, that's what our, our world is selling. And, and I just have to say, like, the, the traditional values versus today's values, uh, it's really a toss-up for my wife and I, for Rebecca, and for, like, it's just, like, what? Eat both. The traditional value says, you're only valuable if you can produce children in a family. And the new modern values are like, oh, well, you've got to show your independence and succeed by yourself and have everything around you as beautiful. And both of them are viewing you and your value based upon what you can produce. Whereas the Bible says you're made in the image of God to worship the supreme creator of the universe. So believe in Jesus and be a child of God despite what you can produce or how much money you can make or what it looks like on social media. This is who you are through Jesus Christ. And, and so modern women in, are very much in the same situation as a Sarah. Your value and your significance is tied to what you can produce or what it looks like on the internet. Instead, the Bible wants us to enter into healthy spaces. When we reject the gospel of Jesus Christ, and when we do things our own way and become to the solutions to our own insecurities and anxieties, we inevitably abuse people. Everyone else becomes toxic, and everyone else, because we need to control things and make them our way because we're in danger and we're insignificant, in order to make these things happen, we have to use others. Uh, I want to get married so that I can be loved. I want to have children so that I can have meaning. I want this, that, this. That's just using people. And yeah, it looks nicer than like using drugs, but it forms the same sort of abandonment and use. And the weird things that come up in your head when you're a parent who's like, my child makes me significant. The weird things you do in your parenting are destructive for that child. When I live my way, I use and abuse others. You start projecting upon them your problems and the, the things that you think everything, and it's just, it's just a disaster in ways that are undescribable in the short amount of time we've got. Instead of trying to become something by doing what you want, need, feel like you need to do, or even worse, what the world tells you to do, just be what God has made you through Jesus Christ. Just be loved and have peace and know your future that God has promised through Jesus. This is the situation that Sarah finds herself in. And, and when we know ancient Near Eastern culture, we realize that this, in Genesis 16, as separated from the, our ways that we live today, was a completely normal and worldly thing to have done back then. Hammurabi's code, which you have heard about, was just like a, you know, first example that we have found of ancient Near Eastern uh, law codes that spread all throughout the ancient Near East, especially in the northeast of the ancient Near East. Hammurabi's code has a specific law tailored to how to give your servant to your husband so that you can adopt the child that is made from that illicit union. That it, it was a cultural thing. They had laws protecting it and how to do it. And, uh, and it was worldliness and it was awful and it leads to abuse. In that way, we could say when I live the world's way, I use and abuse others. It's just more socially acceptable. So that's Sarah's situation. Abraham, he, well, he got to have sex. So that's basically all his, that's his role that he plays in the story. But I want you to see what Sarah says in verse 2, Sarah said to Abraham, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. The Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, the first name of God, has prevented me from bearing children. See, when I'm living my way or the world's way, one of the first things I do in use and abuse of others is use and abuse God. I blame God for not giving me what I want. That's what Sarah's doing here. Sarah's blaming God. Sarah's blaming God the way you and I blame God. God is getting in the way of my happiness. 
I have to get around him. I have to get around him to find happiness. I have to find security uh, on the other side of him. I have to work my way somehow around what God, because what God has given is not enough. It's not enough for my mental health. It's not enough for my security. It's not enough for the problems that are facing me day in and day out. So God's the problem, and I've got to get around him. But secondly, look at verse 5. Sarah said to Abram, may the wrong done to me be on you. See, this is, it's all gone down now, and it didn't work. I gave my servant to your embrace. When she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. Well, that's weird. Like, all of a sudden, the God that was getting in the way of what she needed, is she now, she is now calling on God to get the end outcome that she wants now. So we either blame God for the problems that we have in our life, or we use God to get what we want. Neither is the biblical way that we have relationship with the Lord. Neither is through faith. It, we're, we're surprised at how quickly Sarah could turn the whole thing on its head and blame everybody else. But that's what we do. The whole thing was her idea, and then it blows up in her face. She plays the victim, and she calls on God to judge her husband for the thing that she suggested. And, and the obvious question is, how could Sarai be so upset about Hagar's treatment of her without considering her own treatment of Hagar? Come on. You're blind to... You're doing the very thing you did and will do the very thing that she's doing to you? You excuse it. Yours is just justifiable. Thirdly, though, when we're living our way, it doesn't work. Notice the, the purpose of the plan was, okay, you take my servant that I shall obtain children by her. So the Hammurabi's Code says that when you give your slave to your husband and they produce a child, that child becomes yours. You get to, you get to uh, adopt that child. But it doesn't work. The Ishmael, the child that's brought, is never ever, well, frankly, embraced by Sarai as her child in any way, shape, or form, or ever allowed by God to be stolen from her mom. It, it didn't work, and it turned, and it fails you, and it causes all sorts of layers of brokenness and situation. But that's, that's not where the story leaves us. Let's continue on in verse 7. Sarah deals harshly with her, and she fled from her, verse 6. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to shore. Okay? Okay? And he says, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from my mistress, Sarai. First things you need to know about this text, Hagar was heading back to Egypt. That's important. Uh, the spring on the way to Shur is from the promised land south, heading back to Egypt, which is where she's from. And it makes sense. The angel of the Lord found her. This is the first use of the phrase angel of the Lord. And it's a significant one that theologians and pastors have written about and spent significant time studying. Because when people see and hear from the angel of the Lord, they hear and see from God himself. The angel of the Lord, most of the time in the Old Testament text, is God himself. Now, whether it's pre-incarnate Christ or, yeah, I don't know how this works, but the angel of the Lord, clearly, throughout the Old Testament, when people see the angel of the Lord, they refer to him as God and they bow down and worship. It happens uh, later in the burning bush. It happened to Jacob in his wrestling. Joshua sees the angel of the Lord, uh, and Abraham does. Like, it's, it's the same thing over and over again. These people say, these people refer to hearing from God, and they worship. That's what's happening. The first appearance of the angel of the Lord is to a runaway slave in the middle of the desert. 
just sit on that. The first appearance of the angel of the Lord. Frankly, in many ways, the first visible manifestation in real time of God himself since the Garden of Eden is here. Runaway slave. Notice God asks her two questions. She only has an answer for one, but he asks her two. Where have you come from and where are you going? Hagar answers the first question because in her mind, the first question is the only one worth answering and she might not even have a second an answer to the second question or might not want God to know. I am fleeing from my mistress Sarai. But here's the most important, I think, that, that helps us understand the significance of Genesis 16. God calls Hagar by name. Did you notice that? Chapter 16, Abraham and Sarah are talking about, my servant, my servant, your servant, yes, servant. Never once use her first name. Her first name is used in the text, but by the narrator, not ever in real life in any consequence of any conversation. So Sarah's like, use my servant. And Abraham's like, I'll use your servant. And then Sarah's like, my servant is messing up my life. And Abraham's like, do whatever you want with my servant. Like a dehumanizing, no first name, no personhood, no image of God. But God comes to Hagar and addresses her as a person made in his image. Point number two, God hears, sees, promises, and commands because he cares. God hears, sees, promises, and commands because he cares. The only one not playing the victim, but actually trying to solve the real darkness, solve the problems of our broken world, is God in this text. And I want you to see how active he is. Many of us sit here and think, well, what's God doing? Where is he at? What, what is he doing in the world today? And it could be very easy to not, to ignore the presence of God and to not see what he's doing in the world. He does nothing in the first six verses. He's completely absent out of the mind of Abraham and Sarah. They're practically atheists in the first six verses of this text. But in the last chapter, the last half of the chapter, God hears in verse 7. He searches in, the, in verse 7. He speaks in verse 8. He commands in verse 9. He promises in verse 10. He prophesies in verse 11. He sees in verse 13. And he reveals himself to Hagar at the end of verse 13. Like God enters into the dark spaces, the hopeless spaces, and he's the solution. His active engagement with the broken world is the solution. And so this text that God is the most significant player in this drama of brokenness and fallenness. He calls people out of impossible situations to do impossible things for the glory of God himself. But what he calls her to, you should have a problem with. Okay? Look at, um, look at verse 9. The angel of the Lord said to her, to, again, r reminding us who's speaking in a command, the angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit to her. Now, let's sit with the moral issue of God sending this woman back into abject slavery. Sexual abuse trafficking. Let's just sit in that moment. We can't just glaze over it. The moral difficulty of worshiping a God who allows such evil as displayed in the first six verses of the text and then calls her back? 
I don't want you to read in anything in this text. Uh, Hagar's going to have to run away again later on in Genesis. Uh, and at that point, she's out of water and she's about to die. But that's not this text. There's nothing in this text to indicate that she's about to die or is not going to make it to her destination. Like, it's certainly possible with just what we get from this text that Hagar is actually going to make it back home to family, perhaps even to freedom in Egypt. And God intervenes and sends her back, back into slavery. And we must wrestle with the moral difficulty of what it means to worship a God who calls people into such horrific injustice. But I'm also thankful to worship of God who makes every possible human suffering worth it by revealing who he is so that, and bringing us to him so that we will be with him forever. Like that, that's the corner you've got to turn. Yes, it's awful. Yes, slavery. Yes, tra- all of those things are awful evils in the world today that should not exist because God is holy and God will to have his way and every single one of them are going to face it in the way that will leave our mouth slack jawed and open vengeance is the Lord and right now he's calling his people into painful and unjust situations at times at times God gives us something that makes all possible human suffering, the vic- being a victim of all possible human injustice, slavery, death, all of it. He gives us something that makes them completely worth it. Himself. Himself. I think there's a good human illustration of this that's only going to work for half of us. Okay? Okay? Uh, Because half of us uh, can understand what it means to go through pains and labors, but it all be worth it because the presence of a person, right? For the, the Bible often uses labor pains of childbirth as being a description about you and I and the way we live today. And that lands on half of us and it doesn't land on the other half. You suffer, it's hurt, you painful. You like willingly walk into that, right? Willingly like... I don't understand, I don't understand it when uh, 11 years ago my wife comes to me and she's like, hey, let's, let's have another. I'm like, do you not remember what happened in the hospital? Like, do, like how, how is that? And, and I only watched, right? We don't, this illustration falls on us kind of mute. And we could talk about kidney stones, men, but none of us really know and after you push a kidney stone out, you don't nurse it for every three hours and provide for it for the rest of its life until it goes, and then pay for college, right? Like, that, that's not the way it rolls. The present pain is chosen because of the presence of the person after. So when you read verse 9, the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. What you see in Hagar is no, absolutely no questions. No, like how could you? She's just off in the text. Why? The presence of the person who is revealed to her in such a way that Sarah's abuse is completely worth it. Not justified, not unpunished, but completely worth it. Look at the promise, verse 10. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. Verse 11, the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has listened to your affliction. Underline that, listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man. His hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God of seeing. 
For she said, truly here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore, the well, the well was called bel It lies between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bore Abraham, Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. And it's here that we learn point three. God cares for me so I can obey even when it's hard or unjust. God cares for me even so I can obey even when it's hard or unjust. Now, before we see Hagar's situation, let me just caveat that for a moment. Um, especially ladies. I'm thankful for God's grace in government and policing and living in a country with the rule of law. So yes, God often calls us into difficult and spaces, um, but, oft, but the Lord has also provided police and rules as a grace that protects us. And I am thankful that we all get to call 911 by God's grace. And that is certainly a God-honoring and biblical thing to let the rule, rule of the land pay consequence and preach to that offender uh, the character of God and the gospel through sentences and judges and prison. That's all biblical and fine. So, Making that caveat, in here in this story, God calls Hagar into an unjust space for her good. And I'm thankful for a God who can turn such things that doesn't for the good of his own people. God can take unjust spaces and turn them into glory for his people. God hears, searches, speaks, commands, promises, prophesies, and sees and reveals in the text. He's active. And some of those terms I don't even understand. Like, how does God search? It says in the text, in verse 7, the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness. God's searching for something? Like, beautiful, but how does an omnipresent, omniscient God search for anything? But I love the, the picture. Isn't it perfect? Like if God knows everything and everywhere, why does God search for anything? And, and we have to say in the text, I, I, you know, the text presents God as searching. He doesn't present it, God is taking very long. Right? Like we always talk about how it's always the last place you look. Well, for God, it's always the first place he looks. But that doesn't stop God from actually sitting there and saying, hey, I looked. Because that millisecond between God's intent of finding and the success of him finding is a significant one where it teaches him, teaches us, the place that we have in his heart. How does God search? That's, that's what this text is about. Hagar sees the Lord. And I want you to see, verse 13, how significant this is, of a moment this is for Hagar, who might not even be saved. Might not even be in heaven right now. I would say she is, but it, it, she doesn't get the full explanation of the whole story like we saw from Abraham just a chapter before. But look at what she sees in verse 13. The Lord called, so she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God of seeing. For she said, truly, I have seen him who looks after me. First thing you need to notice, Hagar names God. That that has never happened in all of Scripture, and frankly, it never will happen ever again. God reveals his name to us men. There is nowhere in Scripture besides this text where man attributes a name to God. Now, yes, the name is accurate. Yes, the name is just 
practically a description of what just happened. But nonetheless, for you and I to sit here and be like, God is a God of seeing, that's, that's a big one. Especially for the angel of the Lord to make his first appearance to a runaway Egyptian slave in the desert. And then let's her name him. A name that he will have for all eternity. Adam named the animals because they were beneath him. This is a significant moment. I don't want to make too much of it, but it's an unparalleled moment in human history. And I think it's exactly right because God reveals himself in such a way in our most dark and desperate spaces. Right, like right after giving of the Ten Commandments and the immediate breaking of the most important commandment, the death and destruction of many of the people of Israel, God reveals himself to Moses. In fact, that revelation is significant here in this text. Uh, Hagar says, truly, I have seen him who looks after me. In the Hebrew, it says, truly, I have seen the backside of him who sees me. Does that remind you of anything? Moses, who's writing this, is like, Hagar had the same experience I did. Put me in the cleft of the rock, and I saw the glory of the Lord pass by. I saw the backside of God. Same word here as it is there in Exodus 32. She saw him first. Slave, runaway, Gentile slave. She saw it first. You are a God of seeing. Because the thing that Hagar needed was to know that somebody saw her. Because you've sat there in the darkness with the same need. No one sees me. No one gets what I'm going through. I'm invisible and nobody cares. My family has failed me. No one cares. My country has failed me. No one's cares. And I can't do anything about it. That's where she is. She'll get there again, but that's where she is here in this text. God comes to Hagar and says, Hagar, by her first name, I was looking for you, I know you, I see you. And as you saw in that text, it's important, verse 11, the Lord has listened to your affliction. Intentional. Every, every jot, every tittle of this text. The Lord doesn't hear your cries because sometimes the cries come after and sometimes we don't even have the time, and sometimes we don't even know, the Lord listens to the affliction itself. He sees it in real time, maybe even before we do. He hears the snap of the whip. He hears the breaking of the bone. He hears that those feelings that, he, that you have inside that you can, before you get to put words to them. He is that God. He hears the affliction. He sees the affliction. And he's understanding the situation we're in before we get a second to calculate. That's the kind of God we have. He's not blind. He's not deaf. Brothers and sisters, he is not impotent. He is not far off. He is a God that is searching. He is a God that is speaking in. He is a God who is sees and reveals. And that's the biggest part of this text for me. Verse 13, truly I have seen him who looks after me. Like God is a God of seeing, but he's also a God who reveals that he's a God of seeing. And that's what Hagar needed. She needed to see that he saw her. And you need to see that he is watching you right now in love and grace, in provision and in care. Like you need that. 
Because he's going to call you into some difficult and dark spaces. If God cares for me in that way, what can Sarah do to me? I can obey. I can obey even when it's hard and when it's unjust. So, God sends Hagar back. Don't go to Egypt. Don't be free. Sends her back with a promise. Sends her back with a promise that, number one, this child will be your son. It won't be stolen from you. And we're going to protect you in that way. It's going to be your son. You get to name him. He's your child. Look what he says in verse 12. This is hard for us as modern Christians today. Let me explain it to you. He shall be a wild donkey of a man. That sounds like a put down. It is not. Um... Think wild and free horses. We think of donkeys as like diminutive. <clears throat> That's not the text. Uh, wild and free. In other words, your son's not going to be a slave like you are. You can't put a harness on a wild donkey in the ancient Near East. Your son won't be a slave. When you go back to Egypt, where they sold you to Abram, or gave you as a slave into Abram, you might be a slave again, but stay. It'll be worth it. You've seen me. You know me. It'll be good. And the promise given in verse 10, the angel of the Lord says to you, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. The Lord commands, the angel of the Lord commands her to return, but the angel of the Lord also gives her a promise to multiply her offspring. And that is true today. Uncountable people groups that exist today are descendants of Ishmael in Hagar. In ways that uh, Hagar would never have dreamed of. Which is significant. Because if Hagar went back to Egypt, even if she got her freedom, her ancestors would have died in ten plagues and been destroyed in the Red Sea. And there would be none of them left. Even today, as far as genetic descendants from the people of Egypt, there's like a small town somewhere in the Midwest of, somewhere in the Midwest of Egypt. Most of the people who live in Egypt are not Egyptians genetically, ancient Egyptians. There's a small little town with a couple hundred people who are actual descendants of the people of Egypt. Hagar's descendants are everywhere. Everywhere. And as it stands today, Hagar is the mother of a multitude through Ishmael. But if she had gone home, if she had followed her plan, if she had avoided the difficulty and the unjustness and the diff, she'd have nothing. They would have gotten wiped out. All that to say, when God calls us all into difficult and, and unjust spaces, often you... You and I are unaware of how he is protecting you and saving you for a world to come that you cannot see. God was protecting Hagar's future, fruitfulness, by calling her back into the difficult space. Now notice, and it's important, God does not say return to Sarah and she will stop abusing you. In fact, we know that it gets worse. Genesis 21. God has called saved people into difficult and dark spaces and gives them what they need by revealing himself to them. So she has seen the God who sees her and Sarah can't do anything to ruin that. And you and I can step into whatever God has in front of us. Because God cares. He sees, he searches, he finds, he speaks, he commands. And the same words in which he commands, he promises, he prophesies, 
He cares. That, that's the text. That's God for the runaway Egyptian. How much more for the people of God purchased by the blood of his own son? And you and I can step into even more difficult spaces because God cares. God is using tragedy and unjustness to reveal himself to those who would never know that they need him, who would never know the God who's watching them were it not for having to be driven into the wilderness. You, you, you need to understand and feel this even stronger than you can feel that feeling of like, I don't know how long I can do this. Like, God, I don't see a light at the end of this. I don't see this ending well. Maybe many of you have entered into that numb cycle where you're just trying to get through the day and not let it all fall apart and like if I can just hold it together for today because the, the future is so ominous and the problems are so present that you don't know, you can't even think, you can't even bear the thought of what's in front of you. God is a God of seeing and he is revealing himself to you through Genesis 16. And I don't know how it's going to look like for you. I do know that you can boldly step into difficult and dark spaces because he's with you. But what if it doesn't go this way? What if I don't have enough? What if I'm not enough? What if I'm not strong enough? What if I can't take it? What? Then you will know God as he reveals himself to you in your weakness. Your children will know God as he reveals himself to them through your weakness. You boldly step in and obey. There is a bigger and more significant role that Genesis 16 and Hagar and Ishmael has to play for every single one of us, especially when we understand it historically. Because in the end, Hagar is Israel. Hagar is Israel, a slave in Egypt brought to the promised land who tries to go back, tries to go back to Egypt when it gets difficult and I, I, I want the familiar, I want the this and what if God's enough? She wants to run back to Israel just like Israel wants to run back to Egypt when there's not enough or it doesn't look good or the prospects are bad and the only percentage is chances of this and all that. What they need is a revelation of God. They need to know that God reveals himself to Egyptian runaway pagan slaves because they need to see God. That God who reveals himself to Moses, God who revealed himself to Hagar, is showing himself faithful in Genesis 16. That's how Israel would have read this text after Moses wrote it. Oh, God's done this before. He's got it. We don't have to run back. We can enter into the promised land. In the end, Hagar is every single one of us who were slaves to Satan and our sin and living for ourselves, who have been freed, who have experienced freedom but want to go back because it's difficult. Like we, we go back to our old ways, that old man that Paul describes. We enter back in. We want to, to just kind of crawl back into our old ways of problem, solving problems, the ways our parents did it, the way the world does it, the way our, our living by our own rules. We want to run back. But what you need at this moment is to know that God sees he loves, he cares, and through Jesus Christ, every difficult and dark space will be turned into a victorious story for the glory of the God who saved you. That's Hagar, and that's you and I every day. Can I pray for you? Lord, you are good. 
that you care for us. I thank you for your ability to care for every individual in the room, to number the hairs on their head, to feel the feelings that they felt, to hear their affliction before they even come to grips with it. Lord, you know, you search, you promise, you're everything we need. So for my brothers and sisters who are being called into difficult and dark spaces this week, may they walk with courage and peace knowing that you are a God who sees. May their minds be amazed with wonder in the God who reveals himself. And may you, you, Lord, Be found faithful and true. Lord, give my brothers and sisters just enough success, fruit, promise, answered prayers to move them forward, to encourage them. Just enough. Not so much that we forget to trust you every moment of every day, but just enough to get us through the day, through the next day, to the finish line, trusting and believing you're good even when it's hard to see, because when it's hard to see, you can still see. And Lord, be gracious to us that my brothers and sisters here would not abandon your calling because it's dark and it's difficult. But may their boldness, by their boldness, preach the hope and joy we have in Christ. May parents enter into difficult and dark spaces with boldness and joy in obedience that preaches the truth of the gospel to your son Jesus, of your son Jesus, to their children. And may you be glorified to see the fruit of such faith in the lives of our families, that you would be glorified, you would be honored, and Lord, that we, we would know you even better and better as every day of faith proceeds. For your glory, we pray, and all God's people said, Let's stand and sing. The God who sees us is the God who has revealed himself to us. Let's sing, be thou my vision as, let's, let this be a prayer that we would keep our eyes fixed on him, that we would see him, that we would find joy and delight in him no matter what the situation, no matter what darkness we may.
Well, good morning, Redeemer's family, and welcome. Welcome, especially if this is your first time here with us. My name's Bill. I'm one of the elders here at Redeemer's, and uh, we have a little tradition where we pray for one another, and we need to hear from one another so that if whether you're going through a good time or a hard time or a dark place, we can support and love one another. So please check in, whether you're new or whether you're regular here. There's a QR code. There's a number that you can text and tell us what's going on in your life and how we can support and pray for you. And I'll just give you a moment to do that uh, as I look at the rest of the announcements I'll share. If this is your church home, uh, we'd love to uh, thank you and I encourage you to share and pray and uh, support us. And we have offering boxes in the back, and you can give online, just a friendly reminder. Uh, guest reception is for the people that are here for the first time. We'd love to get to meet you out in the tent, out on the lawn, say hello, and get to know you, and give you a gift from our church. So that's available afterwards out on the grass. Uh, coming up this Thursday is another park day. Uh, 10 to 1 o'clock at Valley Lindo Park in Camarillo. So go and uh, take part in that activity, get to know some people there. Next Sunday is the last Sunday of July, the 30th, and we'll be having our family worship. So there won't be any kids' ministry. The kids will join us here, and we're going to have a special VBS recap. So that should be exciting, as, as a lot of the kids took part in VBS, and it was great out at Arroyo Verde, and we'll get a VBS recap next Sunday. Uh, just a reminder for the parents, we love these facilities. Somebody was pointing out how beautiful the flowers are in the gardens all around us this morning. And uh, a reminder to parents to help your kids to stay on the lawn and the sidewalks. That would be appreciated so that we can enjoy our uh, hospitality here from Grace Church and enjoy the gardens and the wonderful landscaping. And as we close, just to remind us that we are loved by the God that we just saw in uh, chapter. And so we're loved. And we're loved as we get up Monday through Saturday. Each day this week, I would just encourage you to remember God's love. He loves you just the way you are. He loves all of us just the way we are. But he loves us so much, he is not going to leave us just the way we are. That's the God we love. So go, Lord willing, we'll see you next Sunday. Enjoy the rest of your day.